Dr. Jeremy Weiss, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Drayton Bird, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. Drayton's worked with many of the world's leading brands, including American Express, Ford, Microsoft, and many more. He's helped sell everything from Airbus planes and Bentley cars to models of London buses. He's written several books. First, a novel called Some Rats Run Faster. It's 50 years ago this year, Drayton. That's right? That one, 63. Yeah, yeah. It's is 50 years ago. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. And you also wrote that it didn't sell that well for a very important reason, and all writers and speakers should pay attention. So I'm going to ask about that. And you wrote Common Sense Direct and Digital Marketing in 1982, which is in 17 languages. The new version is called Common Sense Marketing. And you also said there's a good reason for that change, which we'll talk about. And you also wrote the book called How to Write a Sales Letter That Sells. You co-founded a marketing agency in 1977, which went on to become the UK's largest direct marketing agency before it was bought out by Ogilvy and Mather in 1984. And you ran the world's largest direct marketing agency for David Ogilvy. You've received numerous awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Capels Awards. The Chartered Institute of Marketing named you as one of the 50 living individuals who've shaped today's marketing. And to top it off, oh, that was... That's not my fault. You keep getting that rubbish. It's not my fault. Don't blame me. <laughs> to top it off, the late advertising great David Ogilvy said that Drayton, quote knows more about direct response, direct marketing than anyone else in the world. Drayton, formally, thank you for, for joining me. I'm half asleep. <laughs> it's night time here. I should be in bed. <laughs> After that intro, you should not be asleep. Since it's Inspired Insider, you know, my question to you, I have to ask, that moment, you know, that moment, what's been a low point moment for you? Because you mentioned several. Um, throughout the interview, and what you think about that pushes you forward, motivates you to to overcome that low point. I've, I'm a coward, I think. Uh, so I try to do the best I can. And my favorite quotation is from Winston Churchill, who said that courage is the ability to go from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Mm hmm. And I think that I'm able to summon up enthusiasm. And there have been long periods in my life when I've been very, very depressed. And particularly after I reached about the late 60s, when I reached the late 60s, you suddenly realize that everybody you, that you, you're dealing with is 30, 40 years younger than you and thinks you're well, well past it. And it's very, very difficult to get business, yeah? And there have been long periods in the last 10 years, not so much now, but earlier on, where I'd, every week, every Monday I'd wake up after the weekend and think, oh, Christ, you know, what are we going to do now? How are we going to survive? Every month, how are we going to survive? I mean, I could have closed everything down, but I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's a despair leading to desperation, leading to yeah. just that effort to, thing to try again and try again and try again and it's happened to me so many repeatedly as you've heard repeatedly things have happened to me yeah where everything you know gone wrong um and somehow one summons up the will to carry on That's what you were there any you points that you just wanted to give up <laughs> only briefly <laughs> Only, no, no, only briefly. I mean, there were terrible things. I, I once went to Australia with my second wife um, to sell fake Chagalls and swimming pool franchises. That's a big that difference. Was, that, was, that was terrible. That was terrible. I had no money. I didn't know anyone. I was thinking maybe I could go and live in Australia. Um, didn't work out. And th that swimming pool thing was another thing. There's a wonderful guy called Sammy Gold that I worked for as a, a marketing director. He was selling swimming pools. And he said, um, and he's, he's from, he was from Brooklyn, I think, and he said, hey, kid, you know, why don't you go over to sell franchises in France? 
So I went to France and I ran and I, we had, I had no money, you know. I ran an ad in Le Figaro, which is like the New York Times, yeah, to get people who might buy swimming pool franchises. Then I went to a friend of mine in advertising and he gave me a free office, yeah. And I thought, what about the language? You know, my French, it's years since I spoke, I learned French when I was young. Years since I'd, I'd, I was lived with a French family for a month or so. Years since I've done it. And I thought, what's going to happen? And then the first guy comes into this office and, uh, and I said, uh, est-ce que vous parlez anglais? Do you speak English? Said, Absolutely pas. Absolutely not. Boy, did my French come back quick. Yeah. The same, I did another job for the, someone else in, in Spain. Um, and I suddenly wrote, we're in a part of Spain where somebody said, nobody spoke any English. And my Spanish, which I'd studied for two years, boy, did that come back fast, you know. I, I had a cameraman on a jeep driving through a, gro a, a grove of olives, yeah, um, filming these girls riding on horses, yeah. For and what? trying to, I was the bloody director. I was making a film about why you should buy property in this godforsaken place, which it was. Yeah. I could go on forever about, you know, and, but the worst, I think one of the worst was this, this French thing because I was there and then I, once I'd got people who were inquiring, I had to try and sell the franchise, sell hot air, yeah? Yeah. And I eventually, I sold the franchise at three o'clock in the morning in a club on the Ile de France in Paris to Michel Le Comte Jalon, Philippe Jalon de la Beau. I sold the franchise. And I remember getting on the phone to Sam three o'clock in the morning. I sold it, Sam. And then the next thing I had to do is take this troop of drunks to go and install some of these pools. They were the most unreliable people I've ever met in my life. I remember lying in bed in despair. What the fuck am I going to do? Yeah. I could go on. Because you, you mentioned, yeah, like, you, know. you, you were bankrupt. You know, there are times you were bankrupt and just horrible things. No, I was never personally bankrupt. My business is Right, your bankrupt. business. I mean, yeah. so what do you tell someone to – what should they start doing to get through some of those things? To, because you just – it seemed like in an instant just push forward and start the next business or started, you know, just did the next thing. You've just got no choice. You, you're either, either going to give up or you're not going to give up. Mm -hmm. And you, you've got no choice. I mean, that actually happened twice. <laughs> I had another business in the same area where I made a horrible... I mean, I could talk to you about my mistakes all night, and I don't have time, but I made another horrible mistake, and it went broke. Yeah. What I did the first time... No, the second time, and I owed the advertising agency a load of money, and he was very angry, and I sat there and I cried. Oh. That works. <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> what do you do with somebody who's crying? Yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, I don't know, I, I just don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you do. What motivates about. you now, now that you've had a great career, you continue to, what motivates you to keep going? Well, number one, I don't think I've had a particularly great career, um, but, um, you know, I mean, this is not exactly nuclear physics, this business, it's, you know, any fool can do it with a bit of effort. Um, I think... Um, well, I'm very happy that the first of the books I wrote is still selling uh, after, you know, 30-odd years, or is it 40-odd years? I can't remember. 30-odd years, yeah? And yeah, I, 1980, yeah. The reason I want to write The Common Sense, the, the other book, which somebody has actually asked me to write anyhow, after I decided to do it, somebody came along to me and said, will you do it? Um, I would like it to last for a long time. Yeah. I think that um what's the purpose of being around and um if you can't make a difference and it, it's actually it's true to say that I, I do get a lot of messages from people um you know not every day but quite a, quite a few days um from maybe most days people saying thank you very much you've been a great help to me and that's and you sort of think, well, what I do is not very important, but it is important to somebody who wants to make a bloody living. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it's a good sure. thing to help people to make a living. Yeah, and I, I think it's a disgrace that um, so many lies are peddled, particularly on the internet. Uh, there are two schools that are the people who tell whopping lies who really know how to persuade, 
and they're brilliant, well worth studying, as long as you don't buy too much from them. Um, and then there are the people who are who are in the big fancy world of you know marketing where they have titles. They're in the C-suite. I saw your post on that. What a load of nonsense. What a load of piffle. The minute you start thinking yourself important, I always remember I had a friend in the 1970s whom I worked with briefly who was the best creative director in Britain, no question. Regularly they run, and he's been dead for about seven or eight years, they run a program, the 100 Best Commercials, yeah? He's written more of those commercials than anyone else. His really? commercials were brilliant. <clears throat> And I remember he came into our office once and he said, Drayton, he said, we've done it. We've written the great ad. We've done the great ad. And he was an art director. I said, but he also wrote very well. And I said, John, for God's sake, I said, what you're talking about is what they, it goes on the back of what they wrap fish and chips in. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to keep a sense of proportion. The minute you start thinking you're important, yeah. How can you be important in this silly business? You know? yeah. How can you? It's ridiculous. Drayden, I want to be the first one. Thank you so much for staying past your bedtime and sharing all your valuable <laughs> insights. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> bye bye, Jeremy. <laughs>